Projektionen wird präsentiert von Podriders.de, das Podcast-Netzwerk. So, finally, we made it. It took us a while, but now we are sitting here together, not physically, but digitally, to talk about form and Titan. I sit here with Eugene Brinkema. And as you hear, we this episode of uh, Projektion Kinogespräche will be held in English. Because Eugene Brinkmer is from the United States. She is Associate Professor of Contemporary Literature and Media at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She studied at Yale, st at the State University of New York at Buffalo, and received her PhD from Brown University. As far as this, that's how people in academia get introduced. And now uh, I would mention all of your uh, all of these uh, texts you wrote she wrote i haven't said hello yet hello uh, <laughs> hello hello <laughs> let's, let's change that but i want before we before we actually go into uh, a conversation i want to uh, stress or i want to point to the two books you wrote the first book uh, that when when was it published was that was 2000? 2014 2014. It's Forms of the Affects. Uh, it was published in Duke University Press. And to sum it up very briefly, it is kind of, or it begins as a critique of what we call the affective turn. And the argument is that affects are not just mere violence or movement or color. It's not just a little bit of form. It's that Affect is something you have to read for. It has a meaning. And I always try to think of it as an affect has a vi visual history or a trace or a fold that leads us back into a discussion about grief, fear and disgust. And through whole of the book, she's analyzing films like Funny Games or uh, like the famous shower scene from Psycho, <laughs> which is one of my favorite parts of the book. The tear. You talk a lot about the tear. Mm -hmm. And then, finally, your new book, Life Destroying Diagrams. What a beautiful title for a book about films. <laughs> This book, we are not talking about it directly, but we try to figure out how you look at films by talking about Titan, the film by Julia Ducourneau. But I try to give all the listeners uh, a short image of what this book is about. It is a radicalization of your radical formalism in a way. <laughs> It is you're trying to find a way of f showing that horror is not not something psych psychological. That is not something or in film, it is it has something to do with forms and with how a film is built. And a film, and as you, and we come to that, as you read a film, it is not just a, that there is content and there is form. You take the whole film as a form, as a structure, as a pattern. And that changes the whole perspective 
on what a film is about. And we try to figure out how that works because that is my main question. Where do you tackle a film? How do you start? Where do you start while you're watching a film? Because you always talk about speculation that is has, mm -hmm. that is important to speculate but before we get into that your book itself is a form it is written in a very specific way yes is form a tool for you to think no um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't begin by calling it a tool. I wouldn't begin by calling it um, a method or a strategy. Um, it is the ground of reading, as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, one of the things that I call this sort of this method of reading is I call it radical formalism. Even though I'm happy to sort of tell everyone who will listen that I hate the word radical. Right? Usually, we should be very suspicious when people use the word radical. It often means the the sort of like least exciting and and most banal. But I love words and I love etymologies. I'm a huge etymology geek, and the etymology of radical is radix, meaning roots. And I really yes. love the idea, right, of going back to the ground, um, the sort of fundamental ground of how you sort of support and generate theoretical claims. Um, I think one thing in my work, though, is we never sort of get past the ground. And I'm okay with that, that we stay with those roots. Um, we yeah. stay with the idea of form um, as this sort of infinitely unpackable aesthetic site um, that generates and, and subtends all speculative questions that we might want to make, the ones we make and all the other ones that we could make. Um, and so for me, it's not a strategy or a tool as, as something we could sort of, you know, contingently provisionally opt into. It is the method of reading that opens up the speculative stakes of claims we want to make about texts. Um, And so I, I sometimes joke, you know, I'm not a weekend formalist. I really, I, I, to me, this is the way that one sort of needs to approach texts in order to actually take their specificity seriously. Why is Irreversible different from Sol Contre Tout? Why is Funny Games different from, you know... I don't know, a, a work by Greenaway or a work by Lanthimos. It, there's something about particularity and concreteness of a specific work. And the only way to sort of take that really seriously is to really begin with its form, not some yes. meta narrative or political agenda or critique, right? But to start with that. Um, yeah, that's, that, that's what's important to me. Because it's the root, because there is nothing yeah. without the form. Exactly. And that's where you start. Well, my question was, a little bit different or I meant it in a different way. I mean, the, our listeners are not able to see the book, mm -hmm. but I am able to see the book and it has a very specific form. There are black pages in it. Yeah. There are very, a lot of, um, you cite a lot of people on the black pages. Mm -hmm. You, there are passages, passages that are, very close to, to literature in a traditional sense, mm -hmm. to, to little poems. So this form you are analyzing takes itself a form in your text. It does. Because so, it's different yeah. from, from movie to movie. It's not the same. It's not that you're using a, a, a specific pattern you thought of, oh, I will do that book this way. It's very surprising when you use different... Well, it's not techniques, but you know what I, what I want to say. I do. When I do the reading of Cabin in the Woods, for example, I think that's maybe the most sort of dramatic example. You know, Cabin in the Woods is interesting to me because the film is formally invested in problems of declension, right? So you have, you know, these sort of sub and subterranean systems. You have a world without stars. Um, and one of the things that started to happen when I started writing on Cabin in the Woods is I found myself constantly wanting um, to produce footnotes and to produce a kind of ag agency to those footnotes notes. And then as I started writing, it became more and more important that the, the theorizing of the film itself start to model this investment in nested declensions. And so over the course of that chapter, I sort of invented typographically a series of nested footnotes um, that begin with the, the sort of the, the claim I'm reading the problem of the grid in Cabin in the Woods and on the line off the grid, there is always another grid, um, which is to say there is no way of getting off the grid in this sort of 
totalizing um, system that the film is proposing as a kind of model of politics. And then un under that becomes this kind of nested footnote that takes over the last third of the chapter, because off the grid is only another grid one can continually read um, until a provisional point at which we pause, which is not a final point, but it's it's where it ends. Yeah. Um, you know, I was influenced by this. I love Bernard Schumi, and I was reading his book, The Manhattan Transcripts, when I was working on, on Life Destroying Diagrams. And there's a moment at the beginning. Do you know that book? No, I don't know it. It's gorgeous. It's just a bunch of architectural diagrams of general scenarios. My favorite being the fall. He wants to diagram what a fall would look like from any okay. kind of structure, right? Like, what would a fall out a window look like? What would a fall from a mountain look like? And at the beginning of the book, he says, this is not a book about architecture, but of architecture. So I was really uh, okay. influenced in the idea of writing a book that wasn't about form, but that was but of form. form. Exactly. The reason why I ask this is that I had a conversation with a friend of mine and we both wondered that how how can she even get through with that? Because in Germany, you wouldn't be allowed to, to publish a book like that in mm -hmm. academia. Or, well, you're allowed to, but you you're going to be excluded, mm. definitely. I remember that while, uh, during my... Uh, um, time at university studying philosophy, I always had to defend those evil continental philosophers oh, like yeah. Derrida, uh, Deleuze, or even Adorno for their writing. Because the analytical philosophers always use a text as if the text is not doing anything with them and as if an argument doesn't need a form. I mean, they, they, and that's interesting because they talk about formalism. They using logic in a very formalistic way, but it, it always seems as they just take a part of it and this process of thinking that thinking always creates a form. And that is what deconstruction is about, um, in their, in Derrida and, um, in, in Derrida's writing, there is this, this, he's, uh, most people say his texts are very similar, but they aren't. They are very different. No, they're very and, different. And he's, he's leaning into the text and he's, he's, in a way, he is doing what you're doing with texts. Not, not in the same way, but I think there are similarities in how he is constructing his text and how form is generated out of it. And how all this, like, difference and all this uh, new words come out of his mind. I mean, I tend to be attracted to thinkers who have a strange status in relation to their own field. So um, I'm looking at my desk, you know, you can't see it right now, but I'm looking around and on the right side, I have three works by Derrida stacked up. And on the left side, there's the new Anne Carson, right? So Anne Carson has a very poetically strange and oblique relationship to cla like to classics. Um, and Derrida always had a very fraught relationship to the field of philosophy. And that's what I find really interesting about those those thinkers and, and writers. Um, I like people who have a kind of obliquity in their relationship to established disciplines and fields. And, you know, Derrida, Blanchot, Deleuze, yes. um, yeah. Foucault sometimes, although though less so, but, you know, and obviously Bart, right? Bart is the is the most important interlocutor for me, even when I'm not writing about him, I'm thinking about him. Um, and these are all writers who really thought of themselves as writers before philosophers, writers before semioticians, writers before classicists, writers before, you know, etc. And so in some ways, I think in, I take the writing of theory really seriously, um, because I want it to be something that generates surprise and, and newness in the encounter with ideas, which takes place in the reading. Um, you know, if, if I could just write it straight, then I'm not sure that I would have been doing as much thinking about form as I as I claim to want to be doing. Um, so yes, there are dialogues in the book, there are these sort of nested footnotes, there are poetic asides. The last third of the book is about love, but I have these um, italicized yeah. asides about love that try to weave through the horror section, so that by the time you get to the end, it becomes clear that that's the only other place of extremity one can go. Um, and then as you noted, the epigraphic interlocutors um, on the black pages in particular, to, to try to produce a kind of dialogue between philosophy and horror that takes place in this encounter of ideas. So I'm, I'm gratified that you find the book a formally interesting object, because that's certainly how I, I set out to construct it. And that's a good way to 
go to Titan because this film is in itself a film or the director, Julia de Cournot, always says that she doesn't want to be put in boxes. Mm -hmm. She tries to use... I mean, talking about genre is something very conservative because... I know those genre geeks who are into that the specific kind of horror film are very very conservative mm -hmm. most of the time. Um and she said she likes to play with it. She likes to play with horror. That is something she can use and this is something she can use and then she is making something new out of it, a mm -hmm. different form in that way. So and and it is a film that people feel attracted to, but they do not really know what to do with it. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of people who love it and adore it, but there are much more people who are like, I don't know, that's too far out there. What is that with the car? So to give our listeners a short help, it is this film about um, Alexia, a girl. Uh, no, she's not a girl. She's 31 in the movie, I think. It's her age is, is mentioned in on the TV set in, in one moment in the film. Mm. She's 31. She's a dancer, and she is trying to find love in a way. She has a sexual relationship with a car. She gets pregnant. She's a she's a ki serial killer in the beginning, and she has to flee. She has to run away for a uh, hideaway from police investigation. And then turns into someone else, to into the son of Vincent, that seems to be um, um, missing for 10 years, as I, mm -hmm. I remember, which I, I wonder what, I'm not so sure whether that's the, f that's the fact that he's really missing. And she's, she is playing this the son and gets accepted by the father and in the end because we do spoilers here that other it doesn't make any sense <laughs> in the end she's giving birth to a car baby or an titan or a baby with a uh, um with metal on the back mm -hmm. and he dies while Vincent is having or is taking care of the baby and the last sentence he says is I'm I'm here or I'm I'm here as she says mm -hmm. Je suis là. so that's the very short it's even hard to, to to summarize that film because it has no real it has a narration but not in this classical sense isn't it it's very hard to summarize to to give us some summary of the film yeah i i often sort of describe it to myself as the, the film doesn't actually take that much interest in its own narrative it'll sort of begin a line um and then sort of dispense with it um we think it's going to be a story about trauma but that's not the trauma that actually the film seems interested in um it seems to solicit interest in the serial yeah. killer narrative and then it dispenses with that it's constantly sort of trying out and abandoning um, these kind of forays into different genres, right? Are we going to be a serial killer film? Are we going to be a feminist horror film? Are we going to be a film about trauma and psychosis? And it, it teases them, right? It tries them out um, yeah. like little set pieces and then they're done. So now we have this film, which is a body in itself. And it's so it's easy to say, okay, it's about bodies. It's about transformation. It's about queerness it's about femininity it's about the male gaze which is one of the theoretical um uh claims that i don't really like because i think it's too simple to always say it's male gaze it's it's um because especially in 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 film critics today everything is male gaze and they forget about how this is constructed and how this is is also intersected with different kind of fear, anger, violence. I mean, we come to that, I suppose. It's all all, all that is in that film. How? Where do you start? Where is this this little piece of form where you get your hands on and start speculating? Um, so I think I was telling you before we started recording that I was I was going to have to in some ways disappoint you today, um, which I don't want to do. But I because I 
I don't have a reading of the film. Um, and that's that's particular to how I work, because for me, what it would take to generate a reading of the film would be to live with it for many, many months, to watch it many, many times over and over, and to start to play with it. And I say this because one of the things that I really find objectionable in the contemporary analysis of aesthetic objects is bringing sort of prior critiques to bear on objects and asking them to basically be examples of decisions we've already made about the world. Um, we've already decided capitalism's a disaster, so let's go find examples of that in the texts that we sort of purport to find progressive. Um, we've yeah. already decided we need to deconstruct gender binarism. Now let's go find the objects that we can then um, sort of use in the service of this critique, in which case, if I analyze the form with that agenda, I'm just going to instrumentalize it for the sake of this critique, right? And that's... So the only thing we're doing is producing examples and examples and exactly. examples, or, or reading examples. And to me, okay, it's, al it's, it's almost an ethical problem. It means we don't actually see the film. We don't actually linger with it and see what it is in its specificity, which I find... The point of thinking <laughs> is to is to linger with that specificity and try to really see one of the things that it's doing. And so, since I don't know in advance what it would reveal, um, for me, I can begin anywhere. And so I do. So I watched the film again yesterday in in knowing that we were going to be having this conversation. And I mean, just on the nitty gritty of my working method, I can't watch a film without taking notes. I mean, it's almost yeah. a, a pathology. I mean, I actually can't, you know, not fill a legal pad. Exactly. <laughs> right. With notes, you're showing me your notebook. Um, it feels strange to me to watch a film without a pen in my hand, because one of the things that I try to do is produce sort of exhaustive description um, without judgment, without interpretation. So I'm not interested in adjudicating what's an important detail, what's not, but just to try to sort of get a handle on it. I almost think of it as a kind of mapping. So this time, as I was doing that, in part because I'm teaching a graduate seminar on color, unlike when I first saw the film in the theater, this time around, I found myself just constantly writing down details about color. Because the color okay. palette in this film is super, super interesting. And it's not something as simplistic as, you know, Alexia is associated with, you know, cool tones and metallic blues and purples. And, you know, Vincent is associated with warm tones and fire. I mean, you can make that argument because that is one of the sort of visual dichotomies and, and sort of like, you know, dichotomies of material that the film is interested in, right? Titanium and fire. But actually, one of the things I noticed as I was taking details is that the film is really interested in these like minor modifications of colors. So in a scene, you'll have um, half of a room be painted in a kind of magenta and the upper half of the room in a light pink. In a moment with one of the cars, you'll have these scenes of dark purple next to blue and black. Now, I'm not reading those yet, but I am trying to notice them and, and take them seriously. So as I was sort of taking notes and color started to be one of the things that kind of caught my attention this time, It made me start thinking about color as a problem of quality. And then this is a film that's also interested in qualities of material and qualities of bodies. Yeah. Were I to linger with that and start to describe it, I do not know what would happen. So one of the things I say in Life Destroying Diagrams is that for me, what radical formalism is, is reading without guarantee. It's a proceeding. It's a it's a it's a it's an ongoingness. It is a reading, but it is reading without guarantee. So I could not tell you at this moment exactly what a reading of those colors and sort of minor differences in color and interest in qualities would turn out to be. However, because I did want to offer sort of something, I did start to tease it out. So do you, can I start to tease out what what that might yeah. look like? Okay. Yeah, definitely. So let's say we start with color in the film. Let's say we bracket violence. Let's say we bracket bodies. Let's say we bracket everything. But we start by describing color. Let's say that color is a problem of quality. We think of qualities as like attributes or properties of objects, but often it's properties of objects in the singular as opposed to relations, which puts multiple forms in dialogue. If we started to read the problem of quality and what, like, what would color bear out as a problem of quality in this film? Well, the film's interested in qualities of light, qualities of material, both of which bear on these sort of interesting profusions of minorly different colors. It's interested in shimmer, it's interested in foam, it's interested in oil, right? It's also interested in qualities of material. This might bring me to then start to meditate on the title, on the idea of titanium. Well, what is titanium but a particular set of qualities, right? The quality of having a high melting point and being corrosion resistant. 
If I were writing about this, I would basically start by thinking about qualities, move to qualities of color, color as a way of foregrounding the problem of quality. That might bring me into qualities of metal and titanium. And then knowing me, I would probably start to think about how titanium is a word itself derived from the Titans, the idea of a mythical yeah. race of giants, um, which is to say new bodies and new forms that were a moment of chaos before the Olympians. It would probably bring me to a series of interlocutors, maybe somebody like Hörderlin and Die Titanen, right? His great sort of like epic meditation on the Titans, um, of which one of the, the final lines is, it is good to rely upon others for no one can bear life alone or no one carries life alone. I might then turn to something like Derrida's reading of that line, where he actually explicitly link, link, uh, links it to grief. Right. He cites this poem in his memorial lecture for Gadamer when he talks about how the memory of a friend will relate to this problem of carrying or bearing the other, that one cannot, in fact, bear life alone, but it's always interceded with withness and relation and the problem of the friend. Um, but Derrida also reads the, the Denkiner trägt das Leben allein as no one also carries only within themselves life. We also carry death within ourself. Um, so our relation to the other is mediated through death. We both bear others, but we also bear within ourselves their death. And I would probably use that to start to think about the relationship um, between Vincent and Adrian slash Alexia as something that's trying to attest to the form of unconditional love. Unconditional love in the midst of grief is a generator of new forms of bodies, new forms of relation, new forms of paternity. And we get there. We get to this claim about unconditional love by starting with the way the film seems deeply invested in color and foregrounding a thinking of the problem of qualities. So what I just said is not a reading, but it is a kind of yeah. map of how I would begin to construct one from color and an interest in qualities. Can we then, in fact, move through a reading that might suggest something about how the film thinks about love and its capacity to generate new relations, new bodies, new forms, new capacities? It's interesting that you start with color because I started with them something different. I, I also did did that but I, I watched the film three times by now um and i watched it yesterday and part of it today again to make some notes and i sometimes it, it has something to do with what you're reading at the moment and obviously i was reading your book and then i stumbled across this little passage you use by michel serre and i love michel serre um, and it's this love and measurement where I, I, I read the quote because I love it so much. He, he, you're citing him. God is not the inverse. It is not the opposite of the wolf. The opposite of the wolf is an opposite wolf. They have the same wet muzzle. They wag the same tail. They show the same fangs. The opposite of evil is an opposite evil. The opposite of violence and murderous cruelty is sym symmetrical and twin horror. Love is not the interverse, uh, the inverse, the opposite of hatred. And in a way, it, I felt like that, that the film has something to do with the idea of violence and love and of hate and love and to me the film falls into two or three parts there is may maybe two parts but there is an, an a part where where all the changing e evolves and i and i um clung to the mirrors in the movie because there are a lot of scenes in the movie where where they are in a triptychon um in the beginning, she is shown that way, and then she and her, Vincent and Alexia, are standing in front of the mirror, and there are these three parts, three three images of his head. And so th this mirror is is like you you that that you can fold in, you can fold it in. And then I had this idea of thinking about what is if this movie is describable as a mirror fold that is playing around with 
the with Lacan, with the Mirror Stadium, with all that, and and try to find out how becoming in this film is shown by structures of mirror or of symmetry. And there, then I stumbled across this other mirror moment. When the film starts, you have this Wayfair Stranger song and the camera is moving through the, through the guts of the car because the car is a living object. In the whole movie, it's not, it's not dead, it's, it's alive. And then it's the accident. And later, when she's dancing... She, him, is dancing this, this, um, or is doing this gender bending dance. The same song is playing. It's the same song. And that is like something I don't know yet what it could mean, but it's not, it's not accidentally that, that she's using it. Something is becoming. She is becoming again because the, the film begins with and becoming. And there are so many moments of becoming in this film. And it's never, Until the end, he is, when he is saying, I'm, I'm there or I'm here, I don't know how to translate it correctly. Um, it's, it's a sense without meaning, because what does it mean in the context of the film? Yeah, it's funny. I, I also noticed those mirrors, um, but they, they made me think sort of less of the direction of the sort of, you know, profilmically real subject and right facing a, a kind of reflective surface and more. I've seen about Bacon's triptychs. Um, but it's interesting to think. Yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah. Sure, right. But it's interesting to think about that in relation to seriality, um, because I think sort of the worst way to read the film, right? The worst way is the way that so many people did, right? It's a serial killer film, which is just a so it was such a strange box to, to, to put the narrative in. I just don't think you earn anything. It doesn't tell you anything about the film. It doesn't get you anything. Um, and it's also not actually really the history it's in dialogue with. It's closer to Lanthimos than it is to Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. Um, yeah, right? definitely. Totally. So, but those mirrors are super interesting because part of what they do is they serialize the image, but within one frame. And so yeah. the film is really interested in these problems of repetition and mutation, reminding us that transformation is a form modification. It's about the formal variability of singular bodies. But then what I like about it is it really pluralizes what transformation might actually mean or be, right? The transformation of the body could be through a hormonal supplement like testosterone or a steroid, right? It could also like be... Like he uses, yes. Exactly. Yes. It could be through a pregnancy. It could be through self-inflicted trauma. It could be through material um, added cybortically to the body like the titanium plate. But also modification can happen through forms of constraint like the binding of the breasts and the binding of the stomach. So what transformation is, is given variable, multiple sort of like polymorphous forms over the course of the film. And the mirrors seem to sort of visually, you know, instantiate that or hystericize it or demonstrate it that every self that, is yeah. many, um, which is why we have all these different sort of names, we have all these different possibilities for gender and all of the binaries and categories that we would start to try to slot things into, including generic boxes, are really against the spirit of what the film seems deeply invested in. And we have this different kind of dancing. She is in this scene where this most most critics um, interpreted gave an interpretation of this male dancing and this pogo dance they're doing, but they most of them didn't see what she was doing or he she he was doing. She was trying to participate in a very clumsy way. She is it is in itself a, a minor transformation and. If not even two minutes later, she's dancing on the top of this fire car in a very disturbing, beautiful, inappropriate, appropriate, sexy way. And this, and everything is there at the moment. It's not just it's terrible or it's violent. It's, it's, it's beautiful and violent. It's love and it's hate. It's, age and it's because he says i'm i'm he's using this testosterone stuff because he's aging and he wants to be to be strong so there is also age You're, he's aging he tries to he tries to be young and he tries to and that is something that i discovered just yesterday that he knows from the be i mean obviously he knows from the beginning that alexia is alexia and not uh, adrian 
But there is this scene where they are training for for uh, um, in this simulation of of a of a fire. Um, now I'm missing the word. You know what I'm going to say. I like the fire simulation. Yeah, the fire simulation. Yeah. And then he sees this burning body in in this cabinet, and I got the feeling that it he, he knows that his son is dead because he died in a fire or in in a simulation or whatever. It doesn't matter, but that changes everything. And then it's love and grief, and but it's not focusing on the trauma. It's focusing on. I was thinking about Deleuze's idea of counter um, um, counter effectuation. Is it right translation? Gegenverwirklichung, gegenverwirklichung, counter. Um, like he's in 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 one book, he's writing about the wound and and he's, uh, of of this writer he has from the First World War, and and. It's the, the writer implements the wound into his own identity by saying this wound has always been there with me. So this implementation, and so it's a film about implementation. To, to, they're trying to implement all the otherness, all the otherness within themselves. So maybe that's also a different route you could take, and that brings maybe a, that opens up a space for color. Because we, we what isn't it the same with colors that we always know for sure what colors mean? Because well, we, we, we certainly them. always claim it. Um, yeah, right. I mean, that's so. I my my graduate seminar this semester is on color. That's also what the next book is going to be about. So color is constantly on my mind, which is almost certainly why I was sort of drawn to it this time, although really the palette is quite striking. I mean, it's it's doing really interesting things um, with with w sort of specific colors and then putting them also in relation to ones that are that are minorly different. Um, I mean, color is the site where people would love to ascribe constant meaning from Natalie Kalmus's, you know, Technicolor meditations on, you know, red always signifying passion or anger um, or yeah, love. That's what I was uh, thinking right, about. Exactly, yeah. right. These, these sort of like neat, you know, symbolic taxonomies. Um, and if that's true, then we're all out of jobs. If that's how the interpretation of texts works, then we can eventually just sort of algorithm algorithmically program in what everything means. And, and we don't actually need to do reading. Because of course, what's really interesting about color is that it confounds all those systems that would purport to stabilize meaning. Um, and so not just through, you know, cultural variation in, you know, white as a symbol of purity, let's say in the West, but a symbol of mourning, let's say in Japan, um, which is really important to know if you if you analyze like Asian horror films, I have to tell my students constantly, um, there's a reason why why, you know, the young dead girls are wearing white, this is funereal wear, yes. uh, right? Um, so that's confounding it. But it's also true that, you know, that color also confounds our efforts to stabilize it by being a problem of perception, by being a problem of subjective difference in interpretation. And, and you know, my favorite color theorists are people like Goethe, who are deeply interested in our subjective relationship to color, um, not as something that stabilizes, but as something that's constantly frustrating our efforts to taxonomize it. So, um, you know, in the theory of colors, he's just constantly saying, well, you know, yellow has this tonality, but it's constantly sort of undone if it's next to blue or if it's a yellow green or if it tacks towards red. Um, so, we, you know, color is precisely a site that, that troubles that. But it's also, I mean, I mean, I love that you brought up the dancing because I think dancing is so fundamental to this film, which is also why, again, it reminds me of Lanthimos. It reminds me so much of both Dogtooth and Alps. Um, I really think Lanthimos is like the great interlocutor for this film. Um, but you know, dancing. What 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 is dancing? What what if we imagine we don't entirely know what dancing is? What if we imagine that dancing is a category that could be broader than simply the scene of the sort of like you know, like electronic dance music in the fire station yeah. or the scene in moving on the car? The moment when she's alone, having taken off the bandages on her enormous swollen pregnant stomach, covered in scratches, and she proceeds to itch her skin such that it contorts yeah. her body and produces a rhythmic relationship, um, an uneven and jagged rhythmic relationship to the body in a state of like frenetic disorientation. Is that a dance? Um, the moment when she's getting fucked by the car, is that a dance? Right? What would it mean to say that dance is simply the aestheticized physicality of the body alone or with others? Because if we describe it that way, then in fact, 
everything in the film is dance. The moments of serial killing in the house when one body keeps approaching and she has to sort of engage in new physical machinations with them, that can be thought of that way. In other words, if the film is interested in aestheticizing the rhythmic and sort of um, corporeal navigations of the body through difficult constraints, constraints which might be other people that need to be eliminated, constraints which might be itching skin, constraints which might be sort of group dynamic. If that's what dance is, then the whole film is dance. And the film is giving us a way of yes. thinking being as a rhythmic problem. So again, if we, you know, again, maybe we don't start with color, maybe we start with rhythm, because the point of, of formalism is that you start from somewhere, and you don't know where it goes. And if we start with color, we might end up in one sort of reading of qualities and unconditional love or a 100 other things. If we start with rhythm, maybe we get to a whole other place. And the idea of rhythmifying an account of the body, so not as a problem of ontology, but a problem of interruptive movements through time, that seems to open up a whole other way of thinking about you know, bodily dissolution, but also bodily generation. So when you say it, maybe the film, the whole film is a dance, then the whole film is a body because mm -hmm. it, she's a body, she has a body within her body because she's pregnant, but she's not pregnant in this. I mean, she's always, it's, she's pregnant, but she's pregnant by a car. Yeah. So it's not just, she, she can know or the form of the film wants us to learn watching again, because it's not represented. It's not a representation of reality. It is kind of in a, in Verrückung. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. in this Heideggerian sense. That's what, what's so interesting about it. And, and yeah. the, the, the dance, what, what, what I was thinking about, you started, or our conversation started by you saying, that form is everywhere and it is, is something that you have to dig deep and it's a start and it's a beginning. It's the essence. Form is the essence, which doesn't mean anything in, in, in the beginning. It's, it's something is, is there. Then we have to, to think about music and, and in a different way because for most people, music is, and not for academics, most academics think a little bit much deeper but when we when we just say okay it's music then they think about chords they think about uh, lyrics they think about um a guitar and a drum set but as soon as you start to listen to ambient music or electronical avant-garde music or industrial music which can could i mean it could have also been a choice for the film to use that music mm -hmm. because it's the cars and the titanium and then okay why not use it? but she's not using it yeah. she's using pop music um and she's she's using this uh, um this i mean the singer of of uh, the band she's playing in this dance scene where everything is kind of um, reddish. Uh, it's um, Island. How how was the name of the band? I'm so bad. I'm so bad with with names. That's terrible. My brain is always. I, I can can't remember names. But the singer was. And that's interesting. The singer was before that band. He was singer in a hardcore band, hmm. and he he was using his voice in a different way. And now, and he changed into something else. And now he still has this. Is there is a reminiscence of his past in his voice? This very deep grumble, mumble, and that's what what I like about it because it, you cannot you cannot say is it aggressive or is it. Is it tender? Mm. It's something in between. And I mean, this is interesting to contrast with a film I know that you know very well, which would be something like Irreversible, right? Um, the way that a film like Irreversible has been written about um, is in relation to those subwoofers, right? That no way is using sound in order to sort of effectively nauseate and do something and disturb the body of the spectator um, in this really visceral and sort uh, of upsetting way, yeah. right? Um, and, and this is a film that's very interested in music, It's very interested in bodies, but I think it's a really open question how much it's interested in working over the spectatorial body in exactly that way. I don't think it's a pure question of sort of disturbance and trauma, because on the level of music, as you noted, it's pop. Um, some of the scenes are sort of highly beautiful. They're really lyricized. Um, and so 
you know, moments of disgust, moments of disturbance tend to get relegated to the visual, right? The the sort of foaming mouth of the first um, murder victim that we see. Yes. But also some of the moments of visually are so incredibly gorgeous, right? The sort of like color, you know, purple color sort of filter over the, the scene when they're dancing. Um, so in other words, the lyrical and the revolting, <laughs> that which would disturb and that which is sort of utterly palatable, if not seductive, they're constant in co- they're constantly in coexistence. Even something like the car accident at the very beginning, um, which is very sudden, it's very traumatic, it's also incredibly beautiful, um, precisely the way that it's sort of cinematically managed. So I feel like the film is, is constantly trying to sort of take bodies and offer them a range of experiences, including the body of the spectator, if, if one is invested in thinking about that. And, you know, to go back to your claim that if the film is in part working through rhythm, then the film is a body. I find that wholly persuasive. Um, I have a very sort of Spinoza, Spinoza by way of Deleuze, you know, yeah, attention yeah, yeah. to bodies, right? That in fact, we only do better by asking, right, what can a body do? Um, and taking a body seriously is something that affects and is affected, in which case that yeah. car is very much a body in relation to a series of other bodies in the scene, including, you know, the bodies that are in the car, the body that it slams into, which is to say the environment at large, the camera itself, um, problems of the image, right? These are all things that affect and are affected by um, the sort of problem that is the car accident event. Likewise, the truck has to be a body, the cars are bodies, um, but also purple is a body, the way that color is something that affects and is affected by the movements within the scene. And it seems to me if we pluralize that we get to a more interesting reading of what bodily transformation might look like. And um, we get past simply the reading, right, that she's masquerading or passing from one gender to another. That, that strikes me as really banal. Instead, what a body is, is this capacity for infinite variation, infinite transformation, without any one form being given priority over another. And that, that is something that irritates a lot of people, because when we are talking about the body of the car, that is also, that has the capacity to affect and be affected, most people would say, but it's not a feeling body. But that's not the point when we talk about bodies, because when we talk about bodies in a very formalistic way, then we have to say that it is affected because it's transformed into something else, mm -hmm. and then it's becoming something else that can, and it changes the way it can affect. And I think that is something that blocks a lot of the academia from digging really into what ca part some scholars in the post-humanist field think about but still it's i mean i just can i know the german uh, um, academia a little better and i know that people who are working on similar fields like you and and writing about similar things that i'm writing have huge problems thinking th about film in that way because Thinking about film in Germany means most of the time thinking about a, the spectator. Mm -hmm. Thinking about what a film does to you. And that's what I liked about your first book, that you were really fighting against this claim. It's not about the spectator. And that's interesting because the, 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 we were not in one single sentence talking about the spectator. We were talking about the film, yeah. what it could be, what he could make or she could make, whether the film has a gender or not. It doesn't matter. So I always feel bored by talking about a spectator and by talking about irreversible. It's a lot of people were just talking about how that affect that film affected mm -hmm. them. Or the audience. There is. I wrote a piece about um, Noé that was published last week, and I dig through a lot of reviews, and in every in every article there is this. Oh, in Cannes there was uh, so many people went out of the yeah. of the premiere, but the film in itself wants to be an expression of something and is expressing so much for itself. And yeah. that's, isn't that the, the, the main point of, or the, is that the core of why people are so irritated about this kind of radical formalism? 
I mean, I think so. I say in the first book that I really want it to be a decontribution to spectatorship studies, um, which at the time felt like a bold thing to say, because I was certainly reared in that tradition. Um, you know, I, I went to Brown to study feminist film theory. Um, I was there working with amazing scholars, but also during the sort of heyday of the early sort of turn to affect, which was a con continuation of feminist and phenomenological film theory writ large that was very, very invested in the spectator. Right? To make a claim about cinema was to make a claim about the spectator. But ultimately, I felt like there is a kind of imperialism to a thinking of the spectator that shuts down other lines of inquiry. And so I said I wanted it to be a decontribution, because I do think that there's some tremendous value in basically bracketing that entire question, which often tacks towards the empirical, which often tacks towards a kind of naive phenomenology, but which certainly to me does not tell us anything about how the aesthetic works. Um, in other words, that doesn't sort of take seriously that that texts are generative sites that are doing things that we can read and that reading itself is a, is a creative, generative, um, active process of thinking. But, but artworks think in that sense. And I'm deeply uninterested in turning the aesthetic into some instrumental um, sort of acquisition for an account of a spectator. Even the best 1970s film theory, even Stephen Heath, right, who I love, right, when he says the spectator is an effect of the text, I can follow him there, but if the spectator is an effect of the text, then that's just not an effect that I'm that interested in reading, um, right? So I, you know, yes, yes, um, and yes. that's the only model that I'm deeply interested in. It is hard, even in the American academic context right now, um, you wouldn't really find people still talking too much about the male gaze and the female gaze, but there's a lot of work being done on the trans gaze. There's a lot of work being done on sort of proliferating different sort of cultural studies categories of identity and then making a gaze theory that's predicated on it. And I just don't happen to think that's the most interesting way to do that kind of work politically. And I also don't think it tells us new things about texts. And, you know, Right. Deleuze is a thinker who's been very influential on me, um, in part for the way that he defined his fields of, of not even study, but the worlds he worked in. He says, philosophy is the generation of concepts. Art is the generation of percepts and affects. And for me, what does thinking look like? It, thinking looks like a kind of generation, a generation of concepts, an engagement with art as a site that generates affects. They are doing the same thing, but that generation of the surprising and the new, um, that encounter with something that is the mark of thinking, real true thinking, to me really does require beginning with the specificity of whatever object you have in front of you and not presuming in advance that we know what it's going to give us as, as a property, right? Or as a commodity. Um, and I have, I have rarely read theories of the spectator recently that I didn't find sort of fell into the same problem of a kind of naive phenomenology, even when they're not writing about themselves, they were often seem like they're writing about themselves. Um, even if they're positing a kind of cultural category, it doesn't strike me as opening up n new lines of inquiry. And, um, there may there may be a political charge to that. In other words, there may be political value that one has in in proliferating those categories of you know spectatorship yeah, identity. Yeah. But it's not in the parlance of my southern upbringing. You know, I don't have a dog in that fight. You know, that is just that is just not where I find the most interesting insights and, and sort of potent problems to emerge in a thinking of film. I feel so close to what you said hmm. because this this idea about that most of the thoughts at the moment are predicated are f just formulations of what everybody knows already. Mm -hmm. And I understand it from a political point of view, as you, you said, it's, I understand there are, there is too, there are not enough trans, trans people in movies, maybe, but By going through all the films and pointing with the finger at something that does not show, doesn't dig deep enough to tell stories about what the films are showing and telling us about. I mean, I love Brian De Palma a lot. And I think that his, his films are very, very complex, especially his, like a film like Body Double, that is so interesting and it's kind of a, and it's always just read as a provocation mm -hmm. and as a violence against women, but there, it has a very specific labyrinthic form in itself that it leads you into kind of a self critique or a counter critique of you're, you're in the mind of a, of a filmmaker who tries to, to fight and, and, the, and, 
what's the the effect of it is that there is a film that is a form in itself that is you you cannot point the finger at it mm -hmm. and say yeah that is a film about that's a thriller oh no it's also about porn oh and it's about trash films and it's about male gaze but it's hitchcock it's not it's so it's so much in it and that's what i'm interested in so i feel that with this idea of Every everything has. It's so based in a in in an idea of identity, and I I'm very frustrated. I don't trust identity because it cl it closes this this whole way of making film that it is even even hard for the before we start recording you said that you like talking to people who work in the field who are architects or filmmakers because they are close to the form but this whole discussion about identity and which identity is is represented another word i don't like representation and which which are represented which are not repre representate uh, represented closes the field of experimentation with mm -hmm. form for the filmmakers itself. Can I tell you a story? Yeah, of course you okay. have to tell me a story. <laughs> um, so for many years before this book came out, I was working with what ended up becoming the last, the last part of the book, the incremental love, the reading of Hanukkah's Amour. So yes. Hanukkah is a filmmaker I love, I feel very close to, I love writing about and thinking about his work. I've written on, you know, maybe five of his films over the course of my, my entire academic career. So I was sort of touring with this talk about Amour. And my whole reading of Amour is about the problem of the increment, and it's about the construction of space as a problem of incrementality in the apartment in Amour. Um, so it's a very, very formalist reading, um, and it works with Sarah and Kierkegaard and different sort of thinkers of love as a problem of incrementality. So I gave this talk at a, a university I won't name, but it's a university that's famous for sort of being very aggressive in questioning their visitors. I gave this talk, and when I was done, um, a scholar raised his hand and he said, okay, look, I buy everything that you're doing in relation to Hanukkah, right? He's a modernist, it makes sense to me, but surely you have to admit that formalism would be an inappropriate method to apply to certain texts. And I said, oh, do tell me more. And he said, for example, you would never want to do a formalist reading of a film like Killer of Sheep. And I said, what a weird and specific thing to say. Why not? And then we continued to have a conversation. Several months go by, I went to another university with a much friendlier audience. I gave the Hanukkah talk again. And in a totally different audience with no overlap, somebody said to me in the question and answer period, you wouldn't want to do this kind of reading on every film, right? That, that would be, that would be a problem. It doesn't work for everything, right? You wouldn't want to do it with like killer of sheep. And at that point, because I'm a slightly difficult person, I decided, well, that's my next half month, half, half year of work. I'm going to go take six months and I'm going to do a formalist <laughs> reading of Charles Burnett's killer of sheep. The, you know, post-Watts, neo-realist study of black life, um, you know, and and in every way a quasi, you know, a neo-realist film that's been read as a quasi-documentary, an account of real, you know, sort of lives in yes. place, right? It's been read by Elizabeth oh. Povinelli and, and, and film scholars as being a film that is about sort of the truth of black life. So I decided to take the film really seriously for me, by taking it as a problem of form, reading it formally, looking at it formally. And what I found as I worked with it over many months was that this was a film that struck me as deeply invested in the problem of counting. So there are references to counting sheep um, as a way of sort of grappling with insomnia. There's a scene, do you remember the moment where the boys are standing on their head and they're counting, but they don't count perfectly backwards. They're counting, you know, 232, 231, 230, 228, 242, 241. They're counting unevenly. So I do an elaborate reading of the problem of counting in relation to killer of sheep, a, a reading that would seem to be operating in total indifference to the political and the documentary and the truth claims that people have sort of applied to the film. But through a reading of the problem of counting, I end up sort of arguing that the film is formally interested in an almost mathematics of precarity, whereby one can have nothing and still always have more to lose, which I liken to the problem of um, the hotel paradox, where an entire hotel can be full, but N plus one is still possible. 
I derived at the reading of precarity, in other words, by starting with formal problems of number and the way that the film, on the level of framing, on the level of counting, and on the level of its own sort of navigation of iterability, grapples with that. But ultimately, at the end of that reading, one of the things that I said is, if this film is meant to demonstrate a prior truth about Black life, we are actually keeping the film from offering its own thinking of a kind of truth that it wants to offer. So instead of trying to impose a reading onto it, what I was hoping to demonstrate was that we take work, any work, I work on gonzo pornography, I work on terror videos, yes. I work on neorealist film, I work on high modernism, I work on schlocky horror films. We take them seriously by looking at how they think about their own formal problems. And from there, we can often derive readings that are new and surprising and generative. Um, but there's also a kind of, there's a charge to me in doing that. I would never take a film and say that it can't be studied this way because it has form. And so reading it seriously allows us to see what we didn't expect to see. So Killer of Sheep thus turns into a different kind of meditation on a different kind of precarity through a different set of terms. Anyway, so that that's my story about being difficult. Um, but also trying to suggest that if we begin by presuming we know what something is about, we will only ever find what we came to see. And that, to me, is both boring, but it is also not a way of advancing questions and opening lines of inquiry and becoming sort of like wonderfully curious about the world, right? It doesn't, it doesn't gesture at anything that we might call speculation. It doesn't see things in a new light. It simply sees a reflection of whatever the critic's agenda was to start with. So in a way... You could also work, and you did that in the end of your first book, in forms of the affect that you did not work just on fictional films, but also on artworks and on documentary films. So mm -hmm. even a document documentary is something that can be formalized or has to be formalized because it is telling us something through that. And that is what frustrates me with documentaries, especially when it comes to give, to write about from a journalistic perspective, because most uh, magazines or newspapers want you to judge and say, mm -hmm. is it good or not good? And I try to find a way doing that, but on the side, I try to find little pieces. But documentaries always, it's like, then no one really gives a critique on them. They just say, well, I, f well, I could, I felt affected or mm -hmm. not, that was, I was interested in or not, I was interested in something different, but they're not with the movie. They are with what they wanted to see. And, and for me, I, I get stricter and stricter. That is no, not criticism. Criticism has, It's not about me. It's not about how I feel when I watch a movie. So I, I seen the, the Northman and privately, like what I, what I like to watch with my, with my wife or my son is I, w I didn't care about that film about Vikings mm -hmm. and about Northman and, and mythology, but The film is so interesting because it, what he's doing and what form he uses to to make a body out of this mythology. And I, I didn't... It's not just about representation. It is... By doing that film, it's a, about a, a mythology of itself, of its own mm -hmm. making. So I don't have to like something to see that it's there is something underneath liking something mm -hmm. entirely and sometimes i think it's the it's the genres or the sort of um, bodies of work that are purported to just render the world neutrally right documentary is one pornography is another um, that are presumed to have no form or to have a neutral form or to have um, a kind of minimal form when actually if you look at it in fact Pornography in particular, because I've been also working on a set of articles doing a formalist reading of, of gonzo pornography, um, is often the field that takes bodies as forms more seriously than anything else I've ever seen, and then subjects them to sort of formal changes and modifications. Documentaries also yeah. regard bodies as forms all the time, um, and of course have their own formal working. Um, and 
you know, we could say that that's the name of the difference, right? That in fact, aesthetic objects do not immediately render the world. Form is the name of that difference. But of course, they differently do that. Um, otherwise, old documentaries would be the same thing. And I think if you don't see form, maybe do old documentaries do look the same to you. If you don't attend to form, maybe old pornography does look different to you. But in fact, if you attend to form, what you see is difference. Um, and you see difference as primary. And I think in seeing difference as primary, you're also able then to sort of see how difference is generative of different problems, of different sort of claims, um, which is why genre as a term is one that I just wholly don't find useful. I'm not interested in taxonomizing and, and sort of grouping things. Um, I'm only, I, I, I just tend to like uh, sort of thinking about those differences, precisely where people imagine they don't exist. How do you react to the accusation of relativism? Mm -hmm. Because that's, I, th I think that you get confronted with that a lot. What is your answer to that? What do you mean by relativism? I'm, I'm nodding because that sounds familiar, but I'm going to let you sort of elaborate. That when, let's make an example with genre. When you are uh, working on genre and trying to find a taxonomy, then you have the safe space where, where you can say this is that and, and uh, thriller, the thriller because A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You cannot do that because your theory is so it's on a it's ever changing your reading is ever changing and you cannot point the finger at something and say this will come out at the end mm -hmm. and that is very irritating for a lot of people because they say then it's then you can make everything out of everything you can so i As you as you said, you, you were talking about this uh, calculating or this miscalculating. I was thinking about Rancière and this this idea of who counts mm -hmm. in in a democracy or in a in a state and who gets miscounted as not being part of, but by miscounting, he is part of. But he's um, and he's working on this whole he's also very on a very formalistic way and he gets a lot of critique because of that that idea that he's not writing from a moral mm -hmm. or moral standpoint how do you react to that like you have no you could do everything you, you can write any anything about everything which i don't i don't think i just play the the the, the devil's advocate devil. um yeah Let me start with genre and then talk about the, the sort of relativism, because I think that they relate to each other. You know, one of the yeah. things that I had as a sort of fundamental problem, and I mean, I, when I say problem, it took me years to decide what I was going to do about this, was I wanted to write about horror. Many of the films I was choosing, everyone would sort of conventionally from the industry to fans to popular discourse would kind of agree. Yeah, you know. Hostel is a horror film. Um, it gets a little harder when you get into the French, right? Calvaire, à l'intérieur, are they horror films or are they more sort of like new French extremity? Um, but there are films like Final Destination that nobody would object or The Human Centipede. Yeah. Nobody would object to me sort of working on them if I was working on horror. But I didn't want to make a claim about genre. I didn't want to work with genre. And I definitely didn't want to do what scholars like Carol Clover, who has a fabulous book. It's from its moment, but I teach it. I love it. Um, but in um, Men, Women and Chainsaws, she has a footnote early on where she says, how do I define what horror is? I go to my local video store and I see how they categorize the films. And that's how I'm going to sort of work with them, which is amazing. If also anachronistic, although I'm old enough to remember when I also went to video stores and relied on their, you know, taxonomies of films. But the reality is, I had this problem. I didn't want to make a claim about genre, but I also wanted to work closely enough with some of the debates that one could say something. And then I know you've read this part, but as you saw at the beginning of the book, what I decided to do was go to the way that somebody like Derrida reads the problems of sedimentation. In that case, he's talking about in the history of geometry. And he talks about how do we get past the problem of the sedimentation of a field to get back to its origin while still relying on the fact that it's because those sedimentations exist that we even have this concept. So I try to take that seriously throughout the book. One of the things I do in the fifth chapter where I do the sort of grand reading of what formalism is to me um, and, and what radical formalism looks like is I talk about how could we ever read an account of the sedimentations of the term form without availing ourselves of a concept of the term form. And likewise, at the beginning, 
I didn't want to not use the word horror. I don't think we get out of the problem of sedimentations of genre um, or the empirical circularity of genre by saying, oh, let's talk about the terrible. Let's talk about extremity. That doesn't get us out of the fact that there is this sedimentation to the word horror and it carries with it a history and it carries a weight and an association of terms and a set of films and problems and aesthetic concerns that we have to deal with. We just can't make that the final answer. And so one of the things that Derrida talks about in his reading of Husserl is he says that Husserl um, was constantly constantly employing sort of different methods, including the zigzag, right? The zigzag. He zigs between critical traditions. And between Husserl and Derrida, I found this idea of the zigzag really sort of productive, um, that one can take seriously the ground of something like a stable genre, and then nevertheless sort of move away from it in digressions, digressions that may be oriented towards that moment that you started with, or those sedimentations you started with, but still generate something new. So it's not that I don't want to use the word horror, but I also don't want to be bound or fully conscripted to the sedimentations of that word. As far as relativism in readings, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think that the readings work or fail as an interpretive problem. In other words, it is to the reader to decide if what has been rendered is something that is provocative, that has sort of thought with the text, that has a kind of rigor in its thinking that seems attentive to the specificity of the text, but also seems to generate new problems. And in that sense, that adjudication is no more certain here than it is in a poetic amble, um, right? And I, I don't mean just to say, like, is the reading beautiful or not? But I, I do mean, is the reading a mode of thinking? Does it generate thinking? Because if so, that is the that is what it's meant to be doing, or that's what I intend for it to be doing, um, not to offer a final interpretation or language of plausibility, right? That, that wouldn't be the language I would bring to bear on it. But is it a model of a kind of thinking? And does one buy that? Can one sort of think with it? Um, yeah. So I think the answer is, I, I would like to think that I earn it through the close readings. Um, in other words, right, if there is a kind of rigor and attentiveness on the level of the close reading, has it been persuasive by starting with the sort of like specificity and concreteness of the text and taking that as seriously as possible as a mode of doing some kind of generative thought? And then my reading itself, because it is a reading, it is also a text, which means it can be read, which means, it, it, yes, it's in, in that sense, of course, it is relative in that it is a form of relation. It invites the reader then to yes, form a kind yes, of relation yes, with it. Yes. So you asked about the form of the book, but I also, I, I think entirely, probably too much about the form of my own writing. Um, the words that I choose, the problems of typography, the rhythm of the spacing, um, those things matter to me because it is a reading. And it is a reading that takes place in language, which is to say my reading can and must be read, um, which of course to me is the exciting thing. It's also the invitation to ongoing thought. Sebastian, I think, is it true? You haven't finished the book yet, but I will, I will tell you. I, I, uh, yeah, tell me. Oh, I was just going to say. I jumped, I jumped <laughs> to the end a little bit oh, okay. because I, I was working on, uh, on the new uh, Noé film on Vortex, which is, everyone says it's so similar to Hanukkah's Amour. Yeah. So I was very um, interested in reading about Amour. Then you've seen that, you know, the, the final line of the book, since, as you said, we, we do spoilers here, um, you know, the final line of the book says, you know, what does it actually mean to kind of suspend critical evaluation, to take seriously the idea that reading is infinite, that it is interpretation all the way down, that you will not arrive at a final payoff. My work will not give us a means of fixing capitalism. It does. It is not, you know, anti-racist political practice. It is not um, the solution to the problems of the contemporary age. It doesn't give us easy ethical evaluations. My work does not do that. It, it polemically does not do that. So the final line of the book is, you know, but could you linger? Could you take seriously what a close reading of form does? Reader, could you embrace this callous form as work? And and that for me is is what it is. So the, the, the interest in relativism is funny to me because I do think of close reading as a practice of work, but work in the sense that someone like Kierkegaard talks about a work of love. It is practice. It is progress. It is work. And the work does not necessarily lead to the payoff that we want or that we expect, but because it's work, it also continually sort of renews itself. And so that idea of an ongoing conversation is, is always what I would hope my work would generate, invite, and, and maybe even demand. I liked how you used relativism. You could, I mean, you could say, I'm a relativist because, and you said that, everything relates. And 
by reading or let, let's make a different example by using a tool the tool is also using me and is changing me by using it so there is no distinct form i mean with distinct something that is closed forms are open and are ever changing while we are reading while we are walking while we are dancing while we are filming and That's what I like, and that's for me. That's post-structuralism, or that's deconstruction, or that is postmodernism, whatever they want to call it. For me, it's a process of of thinking, and then it's work yeah. in a way. It's I, I really love how you dig into a piece of art. Film is is an art form. You 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 you. While reading your your interpretations, you feel that you are breathing the movie and going through it and dancing with it and and get touched by it and you touch it back and and that's why my I started with asking you about the form of the book because then it's it's absolutely necessary that the book itself becomes a form and that a film. A, a, p a little piece on a film, a film critique, has to have a specific form, which is very difficult to get get through with that idea with publishers because they they always want a, a, a text to start with yeah summarize what's going on and well but there is nothing to summarize it's not interesting but it's very hard and that's why I love that. Watching a film, writing writing on a film, and e I would even say that writing about a film is part of cinema. Talking about film is part of cinema, and and that brings, in a, in an ironic ironical way, uh, brings this title by the book of Stephen Shaviro to its form. It's a cinematic body, which I mean, he he departed from that and he changed his theory. And I, I like the book a lot, but it's interesting. Um, I, I uh -huh. love him and I love his work. Um, he's actually written a review of, of my new book that'll come out at some point and it was so generous to send it to me so that, um, because I, I think of him as one of the interlocutors. You know, I, I know he's, he's disowned brilliant. Cinematic he's Body in some ways, but it was a massively influential book for me. I still own it. I refuse to disown it. Um, and I love the way no, that it's, still, it's, it's, it's fabulous. It's very important, yeah. even as a, at the point of departure, where you say, well, I would take it, take a different road. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and there is another thing you said that there is after, when you get rid of the grid, there is another grid. And I had to think of this famous line in one of the chapters of Masumi's book. Um, this famous, I think it's even in, in this famous um, text by him where he says the problem with post-structuralists is that they always end up with the grid <laughs> and he wants to get rid of the grid and uses the, the affect and trying to use the affect to get rid of the grid. And I always felt a little bit lost during reading Masumi. I like him, but in the end, it's. I think he always... In some of his texts, he always knows where he wants to end mm -hmm. up with. I mean, it's funny. De it's Deleuze is one of my guys. I love Deleuze um, because I love Deleuze the formalist. I mean, you cannot read Logic of Sensation, right? The book on Francis Bacon and not just come away thinking, well, D D Deleuze is a formalist. I mean, Deleuze is writing about formalist art historians. They are his interlocutors. He is deeply interested in the relation of, you know, figure and ground and the rhythm of color in that book. I mean, that is, and the cinema books in their own way do it too. Um, you know, his writings on and Beckett. And he is not interested about, uh, he's not interested about the spectator. No, not at way. all. Not at all. And I mean, the Francis Bacon book is literally about affect as a problem of rhythmic modulation of figure in relation to um, the problem of boundary lines and color. Um, and it's an extraordinary thing what happened to Deleuze. I mean, It's interesting. The theorists that I love, I always find it fascinating to look at their afterlives. 
People rarely read Bart. They just use him epigraphically. Bart is a very decorative theorist, I find, and that drives me crazy because there's such substance to his work. Um, but he's also so eminently quotable. Um, but I think, you know, after after his sort of high semiotician days and his late work, when he starts to tack towards a kind of phenomenology, it feels like there's no Barthesian system. So people use him, you know, epigraphically. Um, Derrida, people tend to sort of turn out these kind of in- interesting imitations. But Deleuze, to me, was completely transformed in what happened, um, you know, after his primary work because Deleuzean affect theory takes his sort of model of affect and it turns it into a phenomenology that is just, it's it's highly formalized in Deleuze and And it's just not. (laughs) Yeah. And they try so hard to hide that and to to make a difference between phenomenology and Deleuzean effect theory, yeah. but I think it doesn't work out, especially when you when you close re- when you do a close reading of his texts. And one of the reasons why that happens, I think that most of of the theorists are not working on his uh, theory of language mm-hmm. uh, in logic of sense. His whole logic, he, I mean, the logic of sense is so difficult to understand what he means with with, with sense because sense is not meaning; mm-hmm. it is something that is. It is like a little bit. I, I read it a little bit similar, like like Benjamin uses aura. It is kind of something that is in between of the form and the meaning, and then there is sense yeah. that something that strikes to be important, to be of weight, but not just for humans or for me or for the spectator, but being of weight. To the artwork, yeah. Because in in logic of sense, there is this moment where he describes. I think it's the best description of the fold he's giving. That it's it's kind of a feedback uh, that Bacon is painting a feedback. Yeah. The body is there is an affect, and it's not me as a, as I'm watching the image that is affected by it. I affected by something that is affected by itself. To to end the the, the line of thinking. But that is, I don't I really don't understand how that how that happened. I really don't yeah. understand. Yeah, I I, I totally weird. agree. I mean, I I love the moments in in his work when he talks about you know language stuttering or um, the affective fold of artwork on itself. I mean, he's yeah. I just I agree with you entirely. Um, and so it, you know, and I mean, even also somebody like Serre. So again, Michel Serre is one of the important interlocutors for the passages on love at the end. And then I also wrote something that I never published years ago about Serre and Pontypool and like viral language, because um, Pontypool is a favorite film of mine. I just never figured out how to sort of make it work. Um, but Serre is really interesting to me because in his own writing, he obviously moves between the fables and these sort of interesting sort of poeticy, staticy asides, and then an engagement with the history of philosophy. Um, and for him, they're all sort of equivalent discourses that need to be taken seriously. I find that really interesting because the form of his work then is also participating in, but also critiquing philosophy by standing outside of it. And the work I find most interesting is able to kind of do all of those things at once. So I think part of what happened with Deleuze is, you know, Deleuze never wanted to be assimilated to the field of philosophy um, in, a, in a kind of like, you know, metaphysical narrative. Um, but so his yeah. readings of Nietzsche, his readings of artists, his readings of philosophers, his readings of artworks were always sort of supported by something else. And I'm totally happy to say he's a diagrammatic thinker. He's a formalist thinker, right? That's that's the thing that allows him to both read philosophy, but not fully participate in it. That allows him to read, yes. um, right, yes. aesthetic works as if they were philosophy, because there's something else holding him together. And again, to me, I would call that a kind of formalist interest or a diagrammatic interest, right? Some, something like that allows all of these different modes to happen. Likewise, Serre is a fabulist. It's just that philosophy is one of his fables. Um, and so I, you know, it's these other words, these yes. other terms, yes. right? Bart was a writer. And because he was a writer, he was able, therefore, to enter all these different fields. I'd say the same of Derrida. Um, and so, you know, I, I like thinking about the aesthetic modes of thinking that allow one to stand outside of disciplines and sort of participate, but not belong. And the same goes for all the filmmakers out there. If we start describing Gaspar Noé as a provocateur, which I was, I had an interview with him last uh, last week, and I asked him about how he feels being called a provocateur, and he said, "Ah, oh, they're going to to start to produce a perf- perfume that's called <laughs> provocation, directed by France." <laughs> and that was really funny. He said, "Call me a radical, but I'm I'm." I don't know what provocation is. And then we started talking about Lars von Trier. 
And there's the same. There are these little boxes you put them in and you're not watching the films anymore. You just think that, okay, there is the good old Lars von Trier or there's the good old Claire Denis, which is also funny because Claire Denis made so many different movies in so many different modes that very... In a way, they are very provocative from a feminist perspective when you watch Les Salauds or White Material because it's not a simple moralistic tale of femininity. Um, on the other hand, she made she made those beautiful comedies that are always... I, I, I'm interested... It, there is no big narration of, of one filmmaker. There's just one specific film where they try to, to figure out what in this art form of film can be made visible and in the end we 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 are with forms again mm -hmm. i agree and the only way to find something new and to sort of see something different and, and unexpected right the as yet unthought the unexpected which to me is the, the point of thinking is to have some kind of relation to that some encounter with that is to begin without, you know, with as, as minimal baggage as one can bring, um, to sort of begin from somewhere and then see what happens. And I, I use this expression in my work all the time. Let's see what happens, right? Let's really, yeah. like, read without guarantee and see what happens. The seeing what happens is everything to me. That's, that's what makes this fun. So we could end with that. <laughs> see, let's see what happens with our conversation It's very interesting. That sounds lovely. We'll be Sebastian, very interesting. I've really how enjoyed the people... speaking with you today. It's been just such a pleasure to get to, I mean, to think about a film that I, that I haven't written on to sort of think in real time. And it's super interesting. I'm very thankful. And I have to say, sorry that I didn't make a good um, introduction. It was like, I didn't really say hello to you. I no, was it's fine. too nervous in the <laughs> beginning um, because I haven't, I haven't spoken English for so long. Yeah, on that high level. Oh, I thought so it, I was I like, thought oh it my flowed. God. I thought I really thought it flowed. So I I hope that all the people out there will listen. That's the funny thing about podcasts. You never know when they're gonna listen to it. Maybe in the tube, maybe on the tube, maybe <laughs> in the bed, everywhere. So I say, um, take your forms with you and <laughs> have a good morning, evening, whatever. Ich möchte mich noch an dieser Stelle bedanken für das Zuhören, für eure Ohren, ihre Ohren. Bis bald, bis zum nächsten Mal bei den Projektionen.